speaker asked to show you first the video and then he will uh, he will reach us uh, by video call with his presentation so it's called uh, iris visits and orca aerobics digester stuff that you or I can't eat, like small pits and seeds and everything are fine, skins and peelings are fine, even small bones like chicken bones, fish oh, bones, okay. that's all fine. The work is an on-site aerobic digester, which means there's oxygen involved in the process, mm -hmm. um, through use of an onboard tank of microorganisms. And the way that it's operating is onboard in the main reactor, there's a shaft going through it, there's arms that are aiding in the rotation process to allow more oxygen into the machine. There are as well as these little black plastic pellets that we call biochips, which provide a lot of surface area for the microorganisms which are in a tank in liquid form. As that rotation is happening, the colony of microorganisms is digesting that food waste that's been added. An average of about 75 or 80 percent of most food waste is water to begin with. So that water will get extracted very quickly, and the organisms are going to continue to digest and break down the tiny solid particles that are left until everything within the machine has been broken down into a wastewater format that's uh, one millimeter particle or smaller and will drip through and can be drained outside of the machine. While the lid of the orca is open, it's not operational, so it will just sit here like this. But once it's closed, you turn it back on, and it basically operates 24-7, and it uses around the same amount of power that entire time. That's correct, yeah. yeah. Very low power usage. just plugs into a standard plug that you can plug in your appliances into. Since the organ does produce water with solid particles, and how will a city like New York, their sewer systems and water systems handle that extra water? The city of New York actually has gone as far as to hire wastewater consultants to do a study on on-site food digester solutions and the impact they could have on local infrastructure. And this, the results of the study haven't been released yet, but from what I've heard has been that uh, with hundreds of these things placed in the city, it would be a drop in the bucket. Uh, in the wastewater treatment facility here. Especially in a city like New York, why is it important to be recycling these types of material? One of it, out of every six heavy trucks on the road is a garbage truck. Removing as many of those heavy trucks from the road and, and preventing some of that smog and air quality issues, which is much better for the environment. On a much larger scale, a lot of food waste can be, is digested anaerobically. It's extremely harmful when food waste is rotting in a landfill. It creates a ton of methane gas, depending on, on where you read, somewhere between 20 and 25 times more potent than uh, the CO2. So it's a very uh, big, big, real environmental concern. I think a lot of times people hear green technologies and they think more expensive and less effective, but I think in our technology at least is, is a prime example of a solution that most customers find easier to implement than what they had before. So on average, within 24 hours, food waste is fully digested into an effluent water and go right down the drain. So instead of them trucking this food waste off to a landfill, the rest of their garbage is being fully handled on site. Now we're calling Mr. Lewis via Skype. Welcome to Zoom. Please press nope. Zoom, not Skype. Hello, Lewis. Can you hear us? Can you see us? I can see you perfectly. Good, good, good evening. Um, good afternoon. Good afternoon, yes. <laughs> so, how's your morning in Canada? Uh, we had a look at the presentation you sent us. So, are you going to start with a presentation or are you going to give some insights regarding 
the video we just watched. Well, I thought maybe I could just walk you through a brief presentation, and then maybe if there's any questions, um, the, brief, uh, the presentation was just to kind of show you how in action, what, what in fact, how, how the technology, how technology looks in a real live setting. So if it's okay with everyone, I'll just walk you through a, a presentation. Let me know if you can see my, if, let me know if you can see my screen. Uh, yeah, we can see it. Right. Okay. So my name is Luis Anagos Dacos. Um, I'm the CEO of Orchid Technology. So um, Orchid is a global leader in the development of on-site uh, food waste recycling technology. So let me know if you can see the pages, because sometimes there's a bit of a, we well, should be on page two, and you can see a picture of the Orchid technology. No, we can see the first slide. Great. So traditionally, Process goes like this: food waste is generated, then it's put into a bin, storage, then it's picked up by a truck, and that truck takes it to another building or transfer station, and then from that building, another truck would take it to a landfill or a compost facility, and then in there it would create CO2 and methane. So as you can see, it's a very long, uh, very long process. With Orca, we, again, we think waste is most efficiently recycled at source. So, what, so our system is very simple. Food waste is generated, just like before. It's put into the Orca. It's digested microbially in the breading into a liquid. Goes right down, to the, right down the drain to the wastewater treatment plant. So much, much simpler. No use of trucks. So, with Orca, there's no grinding. There's no shredding. There's no chemicals, um, there's no solids generated, there's, there's nothing to be handled, and there's no odors. Um, it's an aerobic process, um, which means there's air in a sterile fillet, which means it loves heat, and aerobically it accelerates the breakdown of food waste, hydrolyzing it, or turning it into a water. Um, we, add, we, had a, we had our own blend of microorganisms to, um, to speed up the process. Uh, but most of most of the process is organic. Um, it's biological, no different than what happens in the human body. Everything that leaves the orca system leaves through a very fine uh, half millimeter, uh, half millimeter screen. So no solids are going. Um, no solids bigger than half a millimeter are entering the drain. This is what the liquid looks like after it come, after it's been digested. It's treated. Um, 75% is, is H2O water, and that just goes right back into the water system. 20% are carbs, fats, and protein. And if there's anaerobic digesters at the wastewater treatment plant, um, those carbs, fats, and proteins are typically turned into a natural gas. There's 5% minerals, which are typically uh, pulled out and land applied at the wastewater treatment plant. So as you can see, all, all the problems. All the food waste is uh, repurposed. We save money. There's no bags. There's no heavy lifting. Um, and because there's no trucks, it's a lot less expensive than um, traditional waste disposal. There's no odors, um, no solids. Most people put it right in their kitchen. So right where a um, chef uh, would generate food waste um, is where Orca would would be placed. So most people put it right in their in their kitchens. On the environmental side, and we're going to see a few more slides later. Um, again, the, the biggest benefit is there are no trucks required. There's no. Um, you'll see significant reduction in methane pollution, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, um, and everything is 100% recycled. So. We've, um, we hired um, Golden Associates, which is an international uh, engineering consultancy to provide us to conduct a life cycle assessment um, and compare work to other food waste disposal options, uh, compost, landfill, anaerobic digestion, um, in vessel, many, many, many things. And again, we, we, the, results were, the results were tremendous, 65% better and landfill on its impact to climate change, 10 times better than composting on its impact to climate change, 35 times better um, than 
in-vessel composting on human health and 25 times better um, than landfill on human health. So it's significant, significant um, improvements. Uh, it's, a, it's a lot cleaner technology. Um, we have three models. Now we actually have four models. Um, 25, 50, 100. The 25 means it, it processes 25 pounds an hour. Um, the 50, 50 pounds an hour, the OG 100. I think that's approximately 10 kilograms, uh, 20 kilograms, and um, 40, 50 kilograms. Now we also have, what we, um, we just put out what's called a baby orca. And it's a very small system. It's about the size of a, of a dishwasher you would have in your home. And that will handle approximately 8 kilos an hour. Um, orca, anything, what we tell people is if you would eat it, orca would eat it. So you wouldn't put uh, garbage, you wouldn't put metal, you wouldn't eat metal, you wouldn't eat uh, big bones. So orca would not eat it. It works just like a human body. I can skip this part, but it's a very simple installation. All it needs is a um, sanitary drain. Close by to that, just be close to a drain. It needs um, a half inch cold water line, just a connection to cold water. And um, it, uh, obviously the power is different in, in Europe, but it's a regular wall outlet. It's not any special power. It's no different than you would plug in um, a toaster or a microwave oven. What's very interesting with Orca as well is that we have onboard scales. So we're able to accurately measure um, exactly how much weight and waste Orca is processing, when, how, how much, who, um, who is, who's from what department. If it's a large supermarket, they may want to know, is it from our produce department, is it from our bakery department? Um, and this, all this information is uploaded into the cloud and, and a customer has a password and goes on their portal to see exactly what uh, how much food waste they, they, they've recovered. Now, what's interesting about this is that it might cost, um, say, two, you know, two cents U.S. a kilo to process to process uh, to process food waste, but that same that same food um, could possibly cost you five, six dollars a kilo, ten dollars a kilo, depending on what kind of food. And we're, we're, we're noticing now customers are using this data to reduce what they're purchasing. So if they notice they're throwing out a lot, um, if it's a buffet or a large hotel or convention center, if they, if they notice they're, they're throwing out a lot in one day, um, it's changing their behavior. They might purchase uh, a little bit less um, and modify um, modify how much they produce, which, which is a tremendous savings as well. So we're seeing more and more people um, using the data to change their purchasing, um, how they purchase. We have some very, very sophisticated customers. Um, we operate right now um, in Canada, of course, um, the USA, we're in the Middle East, um, UAE, and Saudi. Uh, we're in Australia, we're in New Zealand, we're in the UK, um, and we've just installed our first systems in Mexico. So we're, um, it's Canadian, Canadian technology uh, growing and expanding globally. We're looking for more markets. And that's it for my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. So, any questions here? Uh, there's at least one question from my side about uh, recycling waste into power. Are you working in this field and uh, are you building cooperation with local municipalities and larger urban areas in order to provide some energy efficient solutions? We think that specifically, specifically that work, and then we have other uh, other technologies we're looking at that actually take waste and turn it into energy. But specifically for work on food waste, we think that the wastewater treatment plant is the most efficient way of of managing food waste. And most wastewater treatment plants are equipped now with anaerobic digesters that actually collect the um, collect the collect the methane and turn it into power. So we, we see that as a, as a perfect fit. In fact, we more and more cities now are installing more um, anaerobic digestion capability, um, which, you know, 
they, they need the type of they need the type of food waste workers putting into the system um, to 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 create more more power. Uh, so one more question from my side. Next year, uh, CETA, the agreement between European Union and Canada, is uh, going into force. So, what are your company expecting from this agreement? Or it's just uh, yes to to where? So right now we're exporting to Australia, New Zealand, the Middle East, um, South America. Um, sorry, uh, South Central America. Um, of course, the United States. Um, and and we, we do have an office. We just opened up an office in in the UK as well. So all right. Thank you for your time and your presentation. Have a lot of good Bye. Bye. All right, so we're going over, and the next speaker in our program is uh, uh, Diana Mazutis. We have a talk just a few days ago, and she's also uh, working here in Riga for the Riga Business School and uh, basically she's working for the School of Management University in Ottawa. Uh, her presentation will be about designing cities for one planet living, so green living concept and now we're trying to call her. Are we? Hello, Diana. Can you hear us? Can you see us? I can hear you, yes. Uh, great. Uh, so, uh, I already introduced uh, you and your presentation. Uh, is it going to be about designing cities for one planet living? That's right. I'm just trying to figure out how to share my screen. Yes, we can see the presentation slides. Okay, good. Here we go. All right. All right. I think we're good to launch. Perhaps. There we go. Yeah. Good. good. You can hear me? Yeah, sure. Okay, good. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you so much uh, for the invitation from the Embassy of Canada and for RBS uh, for setting up this connection. Uh, so my name is Diana Mazutis. I'm a professor here at the Telfer School of uh, Business at the University of Ottawa. Uh, my area of sort of specialization is business strategy uh, and sustainability. And so what I thought we'd do today is sort of two things. 15 minutes is not a lot of time. So I thought we would talk about a little bit the, the difficulties, of course, inherent in designing sustainable cities. But I really want to give you an example in the sort of spirit of knowledge transfer uh, of a sustainable development that's being planned uh, right here in Ottawa, not even two kilometers from where I sit in my office. Uh, on CB, which is using this one planet living as a framework for designing a sustainable development of uh, the future. So just a bit of background, obviously there's no uh, shortage of uh, data on the kind of problem situation that we are in right now. So the sort of from to situation where we're uh, experiencing global uh, boom in terms of population growth, of course that means increased urbanization. That means increased stress on energy, increased stress on water, increased stress on food, uh, increased stress on our infrastructure, and so forth. And so how do we move from the current reality in which we are uh, to what this sort of smart city of the future will look like, which has to be, by definition, a smart, sustainable city? 
And of course, this is going to include all sorts of things such as, um, you know, alternative energy, solar, wind, um, electric cars. It's going to include all sorts of different kinds of smart buildings and LEED certified buildings and, and so forth. And the chasm sometimes seems sort of overwhelming between where we are right now uh, and where we kind of need to go. So I thought if you look at a little bit of the drivers and then look at this community that's just down the road and what they're trying to do to plan for it, it might uh, give us a pathway um, to think about how that, that crossing that chasm might look like. So of course, the current reality is that our, our cities are not sustainable uh, and they are not smart. And so uh, what is driving us to this more um, sustainable future are, are these system threats that I just mentioned, that the energy uh, stress, the water stress, uh, climate change, and so forth is pushing that current reality closer to uh, a more sustainable future. But increasingly, we're seeing um, legislation and regulations. I think you just saw in the video that you watched that even the city of New York is saying that it's going to have to have uh, legislation for uh, waste foods and so forth. Of course, here in Canada, we have uh, we've signed on to Paris, uh, the Paris Agreement. That means there's going to be increased regulation for carbon uh, reduction. Uh, also, we have here in Ontario things regulations around waste free in Ontario. So by 2050, we have to have diverted 80% of all of our waste. Uh, and so there's increasing legislation and regulations that are pushing us in that direction. Of course, there's NGOs and non-governmental actions that are also helping propel this. And any kind of hot issue that you might you might be working with uh, in uh, in your region. So here might be sort of water um, stress and, and aging infrastructure, or it could be the GHG emission reductions. Whatever that hot issue is. Uh, it's pushing that current reality closer and closer to this more sustainable future. At the same time, though, we have extraordinarily, extraordinary pressures uh, on the other side. So, of course, we have, uh, you know, the complexity of moving from where we are now to where we need to get to uh, can't be understated. Of course, there's uh, multiple players, uh, private-public uh, partnerships that need to be, be put into place in order to achieve sustainable cities. Political motives, unfortunately, can they can work to both move the current reality in the right direction, but they can also um, work to move the, the current reality in the opposite direction, which is unfortunately what we're seeing right now uh, south of the border uh, of us here in Canada. Uh, cost pressures at any municipality, where you're going to spend your money. A large one, I think, however, is also mindset. So we have um, lots of different mindsets around what what is important, what uh, what we need to be working towards. Uh, that we can't possibly do it, that there's never, it's never possible. When we think about climate change, we think about something that's out there in the future, so we have this mindset that we have time to fix it. So there's all sorts of deep-rooted mindset problems that we need to address. Uh, at the same time, the research that I do is actually at the firm level, the business level, um, at the organizational level, and there the barriers to action on sustainable um, initiatives are, are enormous. And so there you have everything from structures and systems and processes and people and workload and compensation and uh, things just not being in line in order to drive a more sustainable future. So how is it uh, that we, we sort of try to move everything this way uh, and try to minimize the barriers that are on, on this side? And so we really have to think about where it is that we want to get to. And so there's this uh, future fit business benchmark that I, I like to use with my clients. And I sort of suggest we can't just look at where we are right now. Uh, what we did last year and say, okay, let's reduce um, greenhouse gases by 10%, or let's reduce uh, increase energy efficiency by 10%. Progress relative to the past year doesn't really tell us enough. Progress relative to best practice doesn't really tell us enough because the baseline keeps shifting. So we really have to think about what would that sustainable city of the future look like, and then use a sort of process of called backcasting. And so this is based out of the natural step um, framework, which is uh, um, an organization, a non-governmental organization that's developed this sort of uh, backcasting process where you look at what would that sustainable future look like and what do we have to do now in order to get where we want uh, to go. So one of the uh, people that have used this sort of backcasting framework, of course, is the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, and they've issued their vision 2050 goals. And if we look at sort of this slide and we look at the, the far uh, right where we take a, any one of these nine categories, let's say materials, uh, they said, you know what, by 2050, we have to be at zero waste. Reducing waste by 10% is not enough. Reducing waste by 50% is not enough. We have to be at zero waste. So what do we have to do now? How do we back cast from that to get to where we have to go? So one of those things is we need to start thinking about closed loop design. So everything that gets designed from now forward uh, is done in a closed loop value uh, version. We've got value chain innovation. We need energy efficiency in our production. We need to start phasing out landfills. We have to start doing more with less. And then they sort of progress through these, what will that transformation time look like? 
So whatever area that you're in, whatever industry that you're in, if you're in mobility, if you're in buildings or energy and power, they've sort of set this baseline of where it is that we want to go and what is it that we have to do to get there now. And so uh, it's very much mirrored on the, the sustainable development goals that the UN has uh, set several years ago. And the one we're talking about really today is the sort of notion of sustainable cities and sustainable communities. And so the example <clears throat> I want to give to you is, is the one that's just down here. Um, the Dada one is built with one planet living. So of course, right now we're consuming more resources than our planet can um, can provide. We're, we're at 1.5 globally. I mean, in Canada, it's even worse. We're closer to about five uh, planets. In Europe, it's around three planets. So we're we're taking from the planet more than the planet can give. Uh, we're soon going to need three planets uh, in order to sustain the current lifestyle that we have, which of course is, is not feasible. So something has to change. So this, um, this group called Windmill Development uh, here in Ottawa um, has uh, decided to take on this one planet challenge and say, okay, so what would that the sustainable city of the future look like? And their, their goal is actually to build uh, right here uh, one of the world's most sustainable uh, communities. And so there's, there's about um, 10 or 15 uh, cities, communities around uh, the world that have joined on to this one planet action plan. Uh, and it's based around these sort of uh, 10 principles. I, I won't go through them all, but I'll, I'll, I'll highlight a few so that you get a sense of what it is that they're trying to accomplish. Um, but this is uh, just so for a little bit of context for those of you who, who are not that familiar with where Ottawa might be. Of course, there's Latvia there on your uh, right. Uh, Ottawa's all the way over here in Canada. Uh, Ottawa is situated sort of between Toronto and uh, Montreal. We are, of course, the capital uh, of Canada. Ottawa is also unique in that it sits uh, in, on the border of Ontario, which is English-speaking, and Gatineau, which is a, a French-speaking uh, community, and very different cultures between the English-speaking um, Ontario, Ontario culture and uh, the Quebec-speaking culture on the other side of the river. And now this development of their planning is right in the middle of that river. So you've got Ontario uh, on one side, you've got Quebec on the other side. Part of those lands are owned by the federal government, so by the and National Capital Commission. Um, part of those, uh, those lines used to be the Domtar um, paper and metal plant, so they are heavily contaminated industrial waste land. Uh, and it is also a contested land by our Aboriginal um, peoples who, who laid claim to the sacred lands in the Chaudière Falls. So an extraordinarily complex development site, uh, two, feder two um, provincial governments, one federal government, uh, of course, the business that was there was uh, heavily uh, industrialized, and so therefore there's a envi giant environmental component. Uh, and then we have the Aboriginal uh, um, issue as well, which has to be addressed in the development. And so the way that Windmill approached this uh, particular project uh, was, this is, these are some of their, their visions of how it might look like in the future, but that's, this is not uh, the, what the presentation is about. It's really what they did was they took the ecological footprint baseline of where we are right now. So these are the five planets that I mentioned that Canadians are uh, consuming in terms of their ecological footprint. Uh, and they said, okay, so what, what do we want the ZD uh, community to look like? And so we want it to be this one planet city so that we're not consuming more than the resources of one planet. They looked at various different categories like housing and transport and food and consumer goods, private services, government and said, okay, what, does it, what does it look like? So zero carbon buildings are scenario one, that's, like a, that's an absolute, um, every, they're definitely doing this, this is what they've got control over. So all of their buildings in the ZD development will be zero uh, carbon, no emissions, no, uh, no fossil fuels uh, at all. And then they're trying to move the bar also in terms of sustainable infrastructure, having changing consumer behavior uh, for the residents that are going to be living in ZD, uh, and then moving to this one sort of planet uh, city. So they're across the different categories of sustainable design. So what does that mean for transport? Well, reducing uh, reliance on cars. We've got a lot more, uh, less parking spaces, more electrical uh, charging stations, more bicycles, more bicycle lanes, that sort of thing. So they've gone through all of these different uh, areas, and I, I don't want to go through them in a lot of detail, but I can take questions, uh, to sort of say, well, what, would it, what does it take in order to reduce so that we get to that one planet? So if we're at five right now, uh, the reduction uh, is fairly significant across those uh, different categories of sustainable design. So the, the 10 design principles that they have put into place uh, have to do, uh, normally when we think about sustainable cities, we think about the environment, and we think about energy, and we think about carbon, and we think about water. We don't necessarily think about uh, health and happiness, uh, equity, uh, culture, land use, wildlife, uh, local sustainable food. Uh, but they have taken all of these sort of 10 design principles and incorporated them into their 
design. So I want to just focus maybe on three uh, in the interest of time. Uh, here is their zero carbon um, initiative. So what they've done is for each of these different design principles, they've taken, uh, they've set goals, they've taken baselines, and they've identified key performance indicators. So for their goals for the zero carbon, uh, by 2020, 100% reduction in uh, carbon from the national uh, average. So zero uh, carbon emissions by 2020, and they're completely on track uh, to make sure that that occurs. They then send uh, baselines. The baselines are based on uh, on Ottawa uh, and as well as the national average. And then how are they going to be monitoring that by CO2 emissions, both from operating and from the residents who live there? Similarly, with uh, waste, they have made uh, a very ambitious goal to divert uh, all waste. So only two percent ends up in uh, land uh, landfill. Uh, Canadians are pretty good at this in, in general. Uh, so we right now the the national recycling participation rate is 97 percent. So we do. Uh, recycle, we do um, uh, compost uh, and so forth, but so their their goal is also to have this 2% waste, not just in uh, once the city is up and running, but also in the actual construction uh, process. Uh, and so they will be um, measuring diver uh, diversion rates as well as waste to landfill per person. Uh, and lastly, an example would be sort of sustainable water. So here, of course, we need uh, to reduce the amount of water that everybody uses per day, especially the amount of potable water. Uh, and so here they're looking at eliminating the potable water and for things like landscaping uh, and um, non and sewage uh, conveyance and so forth. And again, set uh, baselines and set key performance indicators. So a very kind of a different approach to uh, design than your sort of traditional design where uh, the CEO describes, you know, you, you get the approval to design a project and you just go back to your office and you make your beautiful architecture plans and then you go back to the city and say this is what we want to do. Instead, what they did was that, and what we've tried to do, is, I'm, going to, I'm going to a little bit of an academic, uh, so I'm going to show you a little bit of an academic slide about how I think, how we've analyzed what the process that they went through in order to mitigate some of those um, challenges that they have in terms of design and sustainable city. So the first thing we saw them do really well was this notion of uh, inspirational work. Uh, so rethinking the traditional approach to, to, uh, to, to design and to development uh, they really went back to uh, to the, the core principles of what they wanted to achieve. And what they did was they learned from international best practices. They traveled the world. They went to go see Malmo in Sweden. They went to go see Kuhlenberg. They went to go see uh, or learn from Mass Star City in Abu Dhabi. So all of the sort of best practices in class in terms of design and sustainable cities. Uh, and then they partnered with experts. So the, the, the One Planet Living Framework is in partnership with a company called Bio Regional uh, out of the UK. Uh, and they help uh, municipalities, they help uh, businesses, they help companies uh, in order to develop sustainable plans for the future. So they, they really went out of the box thinking in terms of how they might be able to design, uh, design this. So it's using that kind of backcasting technique. So what would that sustainable city of the future look like and what do we need to do to get there? And they really created this compelling vision that was able to motivate um, this contentious land uh, and to allow um, the sale of it, because of course the both both provincial and um, both provincial governments and the federal government and the uh, National Capital Commission and Domtar, who owned the lands, had to agree on who was going to purchase the lands and what they were going to do with it. And this this vision of the future uh, that they that they created together really allowed that um, that to occur. The second sort of stage I would say was this integration work, which is really very uh, difficult to do to negotiate these complex multi-partner agreements. Uh, and so they had multi, they had a lot of stakeholder um, input sessions. They uh, invited you know a thousand members of the community to a big open house and said, "What would you like us to do?" And what, and what they did really interestingly was they didn't present their finished plans. They presented the ten principles, and they said, "You know, what what do you think about these ten principles? Are, they just, are these the right principles on which to build a sustainable city in the future?" And they got citizen uh, input, they got stakeholder input, they got government input onto these ten design principles. And they said, "If we design." A city that meets these ten principles, would you be a, would you go along with that? And got agreement in principle. And then what they did was, in order to um, mitigate, you could, you could imagine having to go to the Ontario government for permits, then having to go to the Quebec government for permits, then going to the federal government for permits. Uh, what they negotiated instead was a commission that kind of worked together, uh, and they agreed to uh, have a joint decision making process on how to move forward in this land. So it was integration work that they've done between the different stakeholders in order to be able to start to develop that land uh, has really been monumental. This identity work uh, portion also is quite critical and it's a little, a part, of the, part of the bit of an academic lens on that, but it's really about moving from uh, us uh, and them to we, 
which is slightly, it was much more difficult to do than it sounds. So here we had really had to manage the stand. This is the, Abor the Aboriginal issue here in Canada is obviously a very large one. And so there were some uh, protests about using this land for commercial development. Uh, and so they really worked very, very hard to welcome these dissenting views, to work with the, um, the Aboriginal people in open and transparent freedom of communication. They've developed all sorts of inclusive uh, joint projects where they're, they're hiring um, the local Aboriginal uh, youth to help develop, to help construct uh, their teaching and training and helping them in uh, the construction business. They are, have, uh, of course, named the, the community ZB, which is Algonquin uh, for River. It, there's, a, there's a whole reconciliation process that they've put into place here that has allowed um, the, that their vision to flourish at the same time as the Aboriginal uh, community's vision for those lands, which has been really quite uh, remarkable. Where they are right now is in that hard work of leadership, which is the implementation. So um, they need to execute on these very ambitious objectives that they've put together. Uh, they need to hire, they've, they've doubled in size in terms of hiring the right people. As you saw on the previous slide, they have champions for each of those, a champion for water, a champion for carbon, a champion for waste. Uh, those people are securing the right partnerships. They have to, in order to get to zero carbon, for example, they have a district energy system so that partner with Hydro uh, Quebec and Hydro Ontario uh, in order to create that district um, uh, energy system. Uh, as well, there are um, industrial partners there, so there's a local uh, sort of uh, paper plant that will be supplying some of its excess um, heat generated and steam into that project. So they've been securing those partnerships and that implementation work uh, in terms of the hard work of leadership when it comes to designing sustainable cities can't be underestimated. It's really uh, huge. And so what they're doing right now is sort of mobilizing commitment to make sure that, uh, that their visions uh, materialize. And they're right now in their first building phase, the first uh, first couple of uh, condo developments uh, on the ZB uh, site. Moving forward, I think their biggest challenges, of course, will be institutional work. So this is making sure that their vision um, stays true in the long run. And, that they can and so some of it they've embedded in the design. So the sustainable, the zero carbon buildings will be there. The, the zero uh, you know, waste systems that they have uh, designed will are, are hardwired into the infrastructure. Uh, but of course, they're going to need to continually um, maintain commitment and, and confirm alignment with their partners to make sure that everybody's still uh, moving towards that vision of a, a sustainable future uh, that I discussed uh, at the beginning. So that's, that's a sort of a, a, a broad view of um, you know, how, you, how, how does one design a, a sustainable study of the future and by using an example of one that is, they're just trying, and of course, none of this is perfect. They're, they're just in the beginning stages, and, and we don't know what the end stage will be. Uh, but understanding that there are lots of challenges and lots of barriers, I just wanted to present an example of a local uh, initiative over here that uh, is, is trying to overcome uh, some of these uh, challenges with the kinds of leadership work that they have been doing. So that was my quick 15 minutes, and I'm happy to take uh, questions. My mom is going to let this in a minute. All right, then. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I will have a look if we have some questions. Personally, me, I do have a question. So uh, the idea of green development is uh, now running all over the e Europe and world and whole, uh, but there's different approaches from uh, different type of stakeholders. And uh, for example, vision of large cities might be different to vision of smaller cities or uh, uh, for example, national uh, governments. Uh, in your opinion, where is the right starting point uh, to do it more effectively? The businesses have been are a big giant part of the problem. They have to be the biggest part of the solution as well. So I think the innovation uh, and the technology and the know-how comes from the private sector, and then it's the really difficult work of integrating um, with the uh, the community, so public-private partnerships and sort of the development of these cities that uh, that is crucial. But without the private sector coming forward, um, I, I don't believe that much of that, that much can happen. Unless unless you're in an emerging economy, for example, where you've got uh, in sort of China, for example, where you just mandate it. So if you're in that kind of a situation where, the, for example, the Chinese government has mandated that. Uh, if you're doing a new construction uh, outside, so for example, in Beijing, if you're on the fifth ring of development in Beijing and you want to do a new building, you have to adopt a building in the inner core to do retrofit uh, in order to get that contract in the outer ring. That so so governments can dictate. Uh, that doesn't work in all economies. So it certainly doesn't uh, work here in uh, Canada. 
Uh, and so therefore, I think that the, in this particular case that I presented, it was definitely the private sector that brought this forward uh, and then worked with the municipalities in order to make it happen. And I see we have one hour. Ah, no, not the question. So the last question from my side. Um, about SETA agreement, uh, do you think it will somehow affect uh, the green initiatives worldwide for, uh, I don't know, next five years? Uh, are they going to grow more robust, taking into account the agreement, or uh, maybe globalization will affect it in a different way? The trends that I was presenting there that are pushing the S towards sustainability will help mobilize that. So including the CETA agreement, I think that there's, there's a, I'm trying to make a bold statement that there's absolutely no reason uh, today that any new building or any new construction or any new um, you, you know, municipal infrastructure that we're putting up right now cannot be uh, carbon neutral. Uh, so uh, the technology exists, it's just that the, 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 the right political sort of environment has to, to uh, help that. Uh, and, you know, it's unfortunate what we're seeing down in the, in the States at the moment, but I think that, that that is not going to be the way of the future. I think that the private sector is picking up those pieces, uh, and including the CETA agreement, I think it's going to open up opportunities for uh, companies who are developing this technology right now to be able to internationalize it. All right, thank you, and uh, we we'll wish you a very lovely day today. Right, thank you very much. Bye then, Daniel. And the next presentation will be from Sarah Martin, Senior Associate in Mars, Canada. A presentation about achievement showcasing Canadian innovation in the energy sector. So just a few minutes, we are connecting to call. Hello, Sarah, can you hear us? Uh, hi, yes. hi, we can hear you as well. Okay. So, my name is Tim, I'm moderating the event. We have a second okay. session now. Yep. How was your morning in okay. Canada? Great, great, thank you. Okay, so we're waiting to hear your presentation about achievement showcasing Canadian innovation in energy sector, right? Yes, exactly. I'm just trying to figure out how to get my PowerPoint um, up here. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah, one second. Can you can you see that PowerPoint? Yes, we see, we see. Great, okay, we have great. the first slide. Right. Okay, fantastic. Um, so should I just get started? You can give a short introduction if you wish. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, I'll just I'll just uh, get right into it. Um, I guess to start, um, thank you for having me. Uh, I hope so far the conference has been been going well, um, and I'm happy that I'm able to join virtually. Um, I guess the point of today's conversation is, um, you know, to tell you a little bit about. Um, the Advanced Energy Center at um, the Mars Discovery District, and more specifically, a little bit about our approach to innovation um, in the energy sector, uh, both in Canada and, and, and more broadly. Um, so to, to jump right into it, I'll tell you a little bit about Mars, 
Uh, and please, if, if, if something happens with the voice or anything, just, just let me know. Um, so hopefully you can hear me. Um, but Mars is uh, the largest urban innovation hub um, around the world. Uh, we like to make this distinction because um, unlike other innovation hubs um, that are usually located outside of city centers, uh, Mars is in, in a very lucky position that we're actually located um, in downtown Toronto. Um, this uh, is a, a great situation to be in uh, because what that means is that our technology companies that we work with um, and, and you know Mars itself, we have the ability to convene our innovators with um, the financial district, with the academic institutions, with business communities. Um, and so really we have access, a direct line of access to different valuable streams of knowledge. Um, and so Mars is actually, in addition to being the largest urban innovation hub, um, what makes us very different um, is our approach to innovation. Um, so we actually like to describe um, our model uh, based on two pillars. So on the one hand, we have what we call um, our supply side. And the supply side operates very much like other traditional innovation hubs, where we connect our startup companies and our ventures that work across four key areas. And those key areas are clean energy and environment technology, work and learning, finance, and commerce, and health. Um, and so we connect these technology companies um, with capital. We provide mentorship services. So like I said, like a, like a traditional innovation hub on the supply side, um, we have that. Um, but what makes us different is actually our focus on the demand side. So at Mars, um, what we realized a few years ago is that it doesn't matter how much mentorship um, or how much support we can provide to our enterprises and, and, and technology companies, um, if the ecosystem to adopt these technologies doesn't exist, um, then these technologies can only go so far. So on the demand side of Mars, um, which is the second pillar, we really focus on looking at what the barriers currently are that exist to the adoption of innovation. And the Advanced Energy Center, which is the team that I work with, um, is a group at Mars that focuses specifically on this demand side. So we focus on removing the barriers to innovation and technology, um, specifically in the energy sector. Um, and so our mission is to really foster the adoption of innovation um, and innovative energy technologies in Canada. Um, and then from those lessons that we learn in Canada, um, we also work uh, internationally uh, with other markets um, to see you know, how we can share ideas, how we can share successes, uh, and, and leverage these markets beyond uh, Canada. Um, within the Advanced Energy Center, we work across a number of different partners. Um, these are uh, partners that are um, energy sector stakeholders, primarily utilities and distribution companies, uh, both within Canada and beyond. Uh, but we also work very closely with uh, government, government agencies, uh, the private sector. And really, the key is to work with these partners um, across a number of different programs. So we have a program that focuses on community energy and kind of what the, what the trends in community energy are. Uh, we have a program that focuses on building energy efficiency uh, and tries to see what kind of markets and how we can spur more efficiency in the building sector. We have a program that looks at specifically utilities and what the trends are in utility transformation. As I mentioned, a lot of our, our partners are actually utilities themselves. Um, and so we work closely with them to understand what barriers they face um, to the adoption of more innovation, not only, only from a technology perspective, but also from a corporate innovation perspective. Or for example, um, we look a lot at trends within the workforce. 
we're seeing that within the workforce, the number um, of different changes. Uh, and so we work with utilities to understand, you know, how do you attract the top talents? Um, what kind of HR processes need to change um, in terms of training uh, and actually increasing the capacity of your workforce to adapt to these trends? How, how do we need to embed more innovative cultures and innovative way of thinking within the workforce? And then again, um, all of this work that we do within Canada, we try to leverage it and we actually study um, other international markets um, and see how, how we can share um, our learnings uh, internationally. So really, as I mentioned, what we try to do is we try to keep a close eye on what's happening uh, in the energy market um, and work with our partners um, so that they can stay relevant given these changes. Um, and of course, one of the biggest disruptions that we're seeing in the electricity space um, with regards to our utilities um, is what we all, uh, I'm sure we've all heard of, um, you know, the utility death, death spiral. Um, and so the utility death spiral really, you know, what it, what it boils down to is that utilities are currently being threatened um, by the loss of customers. Uh, both at the residential level um, and at you know larger uh, customers such as industrial or commercial customers, and the idea here is that although it, it might not be fully there yet, customers are increasingly having the opportunity through new technologies and through um, drops in technology costs to slowly start disconnecting, if not fully to a certain degree from their utilities, um, which is putting a lot of pressure um, on utilities. Um, we've known about this for years. Um, these are some of the most um, shocking kind of headlines that have been coming out um, through big news sources um, since as early as 2013. So this isn't news, um, but what we are seeing is that um, although this hasn't quite been a reality um, for all customers, um, there are huge trends uh, in technologies that are increasingly uh, making um, this a, a, a real possibility, a viable option. Um, so for example, we're seeing a growth in microgrids worldwide. Um, you know, the global market for microgrids is growing and will continue to grow in the foreseeable future. Microgrids are becoming uh, increasingly an opportunity for customers such as um, commercial and industrial customers. With the drop of in prices in lithium ion batteries, we've seen uh, an incredible drop over the last three years of 60% in lithium ion batteries. Um, in the last one year alone, 40%. Uh, in these costs. So really what this ma is making is uh, alternative options such as solar PV and microgrids um, a reality for, for a lot of customers. Um, and you know this trend started in, in Europe and more specifically Germany. Um, you know what we saw a few years ago uh, a massive increase in, in renewable energy which ended up um, you know leading to a massive decrease in, in wholesale electricity prices, uh, which put increasing uh, pressures on utilities uh, and huge monetary losses uh, for utilities. Uh, and this phenomenon isn't only being seen in Germany and Europe, um, but we're also seeing it happen um, in other countries around the world. In Australia, for example, um, the convergence of four factors has led to a, a, a very steep uptake of um, solar PV. Um, so Australia is a very interesting example. Um, very high customer dissatisfaction with the utilities in Australia. A few years ago, there was also falling energy demand. That combined with steadily increasing electricity prices um, while the cost of alternatives um, were falling. Um, there was also a, a natural disaster which led to grid failures, especially uh, at the periphery of the grid. So the convergence of all of these factors has, has really led to a pretty significant push towards standalone substitutes. Um, and, and the reality of grid defection uh, being, being a true one um, in Australia. In Ontario, similar trends. 
although not to the same uh, extent. Uh, but what we're seeing is uh, before a recent change uh, in that our electricity prices, uh, which was something called the Fair Hydro Plan, um, uh, solar PV uh, actually achieved grid parity. So again, just to, to say that, that these, uh, these alternatives are, are actually becoming a reality, not only in Europe, where we often hear these stories, but, but around the world as well. And what I, I think what, what the most important piece, and, and something that we at the AEC, the, um, the Advanced Energy Center, um, we're looking at is really um, this is all about shifting customer expectations. Um, so with the cost of alternatives coming down, with customer choices becoming increasingly more uh, variety in customer choices, an increasing amount of competition, um, and also an increasing amount of customer expectations from their utilities, there's really uh, an energy sector disruption that's happening. All of this is combined by an increasing amount of data um, that's being available. And what we're seeing, um, and, and, and these are trends that are coming out of other sectors, not just the energy sector, is that successful companies, um, and specifically for the energy sector, are those um, that really are able to develop their ability to turn big data into insights that will drive value for their customers. So those companies that are constantly able to be customer centric are the companies um, that are going to be successful in the future. And as I said, you know, these are trends that have been seen in other sectors. Um, and we're really looking to learn from those trends and bring them to, to the energy space. So as we all know, um, you know, if we look at the hospitality sector, for example, you have big chains such as the Marriott, who you know, uh, really dominated the market for hospitality and really knew their business model inside and out has virtually been disrupted by uh, new technology companies uh, and, and applications such as Airbnb who really make the customer experience um, easy. Um, and you know, there's just like increasing options um, through Airbnb. Similarly, if you look at um, in the movie industry uh, in, in, in the US and Canada, where we had large companies such as Blockbuster, um, which um, offered uh, you know, movie uh, varieties for their customer, that has literally been disrupted by Netflix. Um, again, in the transportation sector, we were seeing the taxi industry being completely transformed by a new application, Uber, um, which really is all about making the experience easier for the customer. So again, we're trying to take these insights and understanding how they apply in the energy sector. We know that the energy sector disruption is real with the introduction um, or with the entrance of players such as Google and Tesla, who are really taking big data and understanding um, you know, how do we serve the energy customers um, the way that they want to be served. Um, and so yeah, so as I mentioned uh, previously, the work that we do here at the Advanced Energy Center is really looking at not only the um, energy technologies that are at hand, but we really look at the energy uh, at the ecosystem um, that and where innovation within that e ecosystem needs to happen. Um, whether it's at the, the corporate innovation level, the workforce transformation level, um, or connecting our utilities with the leading edge um, technologies in. AI, machine learning, blockchain, um, really so that they can stay at the forefront uh, of what this all means and how to use the data that is available uh, to stay relevant. Um, so yeah, so I've kept it short, but that was my presentation. Um, I don't know if there's uh, any, any questions or if there's time for it, but um, you can uh, definitely feel free to reach me um, at smartin at marsdd.com. All right, Sarah, thank you for the presentation. We do have a time for one short question, maybe someone. 
not really, but you mentioned the blockchain technology. So uh, speaking about the blockchain, especially in terms of ICO for uh, large urban areas, uh, what do you think about perspectives for next uh, two, five years? All right, thank you then. Uh, thank you for your presentation and we wish you a very fruitful, lucky day. Bye then. So we almost done with today's agenda. Now we're going to have a call with uh, our uh, last uh, live speaker for today and then uh, for the final very final presentation. We are going to have a short uh, video from Mr. Curtis McBride, uh, who cannot participate uh, due to technical issues. So, and now we are going to welcome. So, and and now we are uh, welcome Mr. Colin Allen Mansey, the head of uh, City of Kitchener Innovation Lab, Canada. Uh, hello, can you hear us? Uh, yeah, we can hear you. So, uh, how are you today? Very good. Very good. I, uh, we've got a brief 15 minutes and uh, I've got a fairly uh, intensive uh, slide deck for you. So, um, there's a whole bunch of information in there with, uh, and I've left my contact details. So, if you do have any questions, feel free to follow up afterwards. Probably we will. Uh, so, uh, let's start with the presentation. Okay, great. Uh, so, as you've already mentioned, my name is Carl Allen Muncy. I am the lab director here at the City of Kitchener. Uh, we have a, uh, an innovation lab that we've uh, recently set up. But um, in order for us to operate uh, a lab, you kind of need a whole bunch of skills. Uh, scaling through from um, <laughs> design thinking and marketing through to uh, through to development and a whole bunch of other stuff. So I've got a fairly eclectic background, uh, ultimately starting out in tech, moving more into the commercialization of uh, digital products, uh, and then moving on to more recently uh, another corporate innovation lab that, uh, that I ran and uh, scaled from one to 15 people, and it went from uh, zero to three uh, commercialized products. So uh, very intensive, uh, but something that qualifies uh, qualifies us as, uh, as lab directors. So my details are at the bottom of the screen. Feel free to obviously connect with me on social. It's probably the easiest way to get hold of me, or the main address is at the end as well. So the interesting thing uh, about our lab um, is there's a whole lot that actually takes place. And uh, I've got a bunch to, uh, to get through that you should be able to uh, to see uh, a relatively a relatively good flow. Uh, so the things we're going to cover, we're going to talk about the uh, the Civic Lab uh, as itself and as an initiative of the City of Kitchener and its context within the ecosystem here, which is incredibly startup centric. Uh, and I can talk to why that validates and qualifies our location decisions operationally and structurally. What do we do as a lab? How does it operate? And how does it look? and how do we leverage that into, uh, into some results for the lab. Uh, then, key to you guys, building a smart city in some of the initial projects that we're, uh, we're a part of and that we've identified as, uh, as part of our mandate. And then I'd like to just wrap up by just talking about some of the international conversation around the smart city concepts and, uh, and some of the things that we're a part of here. 
So the, the vision and the lab, how does a lab come to be? So originally this went to council, it's a municipal lab, so uh, obviously everything that we do has to go through uh, local government. So there was a proposition made a couple of years ago to uh, transition, as we see in a lot of, uh, a lot of cities at the moment, uh, transition our lighting over to LED from high pressure sodium bulbs. Uh, and that's predominantly done internationally and, and locally at the local level for, uh, for financial reasons. So one of the things that uh, was proposed was two, uh, two options given to, to council. One was to essentially make the transition to LED lighting, uh, make those savings and, uh, and move on. And option two was to take some of those savings uh, and invest them into smart city initiatives uh, within the city. So we did things like insert the adaptive lighting controls that will allow us to have a smart grid, which will also allow us in turn to do city-wide Wi-Fi and a bunch of other IoT-based applications. So there's some interesting things that we're doing there. There was a $300,000 uh, um, amount allocated to those smart city initiatives, uh, specifically this lab being run as a uh, as an element of that. And the reason that got through council was because there was an original intent. There was a digital strategy to be put forth to the council as a city uh, to essentially say, this is what we're doing as a city. This is what we need to do for our citizens. There's a link at the bottom there. I, uh, I suggest that uh, you grab a note of that and, uh, and maybe follow up and have a look there. That's the Digital Kitchener website. There's a whole bunch of information on there. There's also a couple of really good uh, videos that explain some of the things that we're doing. So the strategy put forward, or the vision really, as we like to call it, was to ultimately make Kitchener a better place to live, work, and play. And one of the things that we're trying to do as a lab is to put forward initiatives and some, to build some, not only just some proof of concepts, but some early stage and beta products on the digital side so that we can actually have uh, some stuff to give to the uh, to the, the citizens. So the lab operates, uh, as you can imagine, a city has uh, a whole bunch of things that we would want to do. Uh, but in order for us to quantify our time and be able to effectively build a, uh, a process that we can replicate, we needed to build a structure and a mandate for the, uh, for the lab. So I'll show you what that looks like. Ultimately, we're, uh, we're in the early stages, so to give you some concept of time, uh, to get to this point has probably taken a couple of years of at least lobbying and planning internally uh, as well as budgeting, but the lab's only actually been operational for about eight weeks, so it's incredibly intensive uh, and we're actually scaling up right now. So to give you an idea of how that works, we follow a similar model to some corporate innovation labs uh, and we have uh, a co-op team base as well as uh, what we're proposing is a lab director, myself, and a technical lead, both for continuity of development, of products, uh, and experience for uh, our co-ops or our interns who are also uh, on our development team. In order to quantify what it is that we're doing in terms of initiatives, there's four main categories that we're trying to work within. Efficiency, insight, cost, and user experience. So user experience, making a, a better and improve the customer experience, uh, in the traditional sense of corporate innovation labs and design thinking, but also in terms of what it's like to work at the city, what it's like to live within the city. So cost, savings and revenue, that's a fairly obvious, obvious one as a, as a city. Insights, so better insights and decision making knowledge and efficiencies. How can we save time and effort in doing and performing specific tasks? This is a design thinking process that uh, runs through uh, also a development process to take things from scope uh, and idea through to actually delivery and deployment. I'll, uh, I'll share these slides with you to give you an idea. On the development side, when we actually get to working on products, digital products predominantly, we are using agile project management flow. Uh, some of you may be familiar with Scrum and Sprints, so I'm not gonna go into too much detail there because some of the stuff that you're interested in is the actual smart city stuff. So we have a 70-20-10 mandate. So 70% is uh, reinforcing core initiatives within the city. So that will be things like backing up the smart city initiatives for uh, deployment of smart city lighting, uh, working with all the digital side of uh, the data collection, what is, how we're gonna leverage the open data aspect of what it is that we're doing and also the connectivity 
within the city, both from an IoT perspective and a, uh, and a data perspective. 20% would be moderate risk projects, and by risk, I mean we're going to be doing a lot more facilitation with the citizens of the community and finding out what, uh, what is that they're specifically looking for uh, within their communities, and 10% uh, internally, we will call it high risk, but ultimately it's uh, checking into new technologies that uh, the city isn't even aware that it needs yet. So a smart city, putting the user first in terms of user experience. So the big things that we're putting forward in terms of projects for our lab are things like leveraging the network, as I just mentioned, which is an IPv6 network, so a standard uh, TCP uh, network for us to be able to use for both IoT, for web, and uh, other network-based applications. Uh, things in the IoT side, for, from a customer perspective, improved parking awareness, wireless data collection of all public utilities, so water, gas, electric, that sort of thing, where we're not sending people out, and then waste and water management, so we can use um, digital data, both hardware and software, to make some better decisions on how we uh, do people management in terms of the city. There's some open data initiatives that we're part of. There's uh, an incredible group here called uh, ODX, the uh, Ontario Digital Exchange Group, which is part of Communitech, which is another organization that you should look at if you're looking into smart cities and uh, startup communities internationally. So one of the other things, as I mentioned, we're going to try and increase local awareness about what it is that we're doing as a, as a lab and as a city by facilitating conversation with, uh, with the community. That's going to be a big aspect of of the lab and some of the things that we do and, and embarking on that conversation. So right now we have uh, just over 21,000 lights that have been converted over to LED uh, and that whole smart grid initiative is going to enable us to do an incredible amount of, uh, of, of digital data collection and servicing for the community. So we're actually really looking forward to that. And uh, some of the other services beneath, um, beneath that are going to be working with local businesses, local partners, and other digital companies and trying to streamline how we effectively work with startups in the community. This, uh, conversations like this are incredibly important to us. Uh, in terms of the smart city economy, it's a knowledge economy, so conversation and collaboration inter internationally is, is really allowing us to, to get ahead of the game and, and we're really punching ahead of our, uh, above our weight in terms of some of the moves that we're making and some of the ground that we're breaking uh, in relation to the size of our municipality. So embarking in conversations like this have been key. Uh, we've just got back from uh, an incredible trip uh, that was organized by a group here called Communitech uh, to visit uh, Berlin in Germany and find out what they're doing on both the accelerators, incubators, and startup uh, community side, which we know has a big impact on the smart city uh, economies. So that's incredibly uh, incredibly useful. And one of the things that I want to do, because I know we're at, at time, is uh, really have a conversation with, with you guys and really find out more about what's going on within, uh, within your city and within your country, uh, and also find out more on a, on a local level what it takes to, uh, to build a smarter economy and a smarter city. Uh, so we can take those as insights and data to make better decisions for us as a lab uh, but also for us as a city. So please uh, feel free to connect with me. I would love to, uh, to answer some of your questions in any of the time that we have left. There's a ton of information to take in, uh, I'm aware, but uh, it's very difficult to almost get across the concept of a lab, where it sits within the placement of a municipal organization and how we affect uh, the citizens of that, um, of that, that community through digital initiatives. So there's a lot there, and I would love to, to hear some questions or even follow up with you guys afterwards. Uh, well, Carol, thank you for a really exciting presentation. As uh, many of us do develop uh, projects in small teams, and agile techniques are very popular right now, you mentioned that there's also uh, some casual problems. For example, developers uh, accustomed to working at a modest autonomously we find that scrum is unnecessary and slow them down so how you figure out this problem yeah well ultimately we still need to be able to quantify what it is that we're working on so multiple projects meaning that we have multiple uh, deadlines and deliverables at concurrent at any one time uh, so one of the things that we need to do is be able to quantify 
some of that. It's not. I wouldn't necessarily say it's uh, as rigid as it would be and has been in a, in a corporate innovation environment, but we still need to create some specific timelines and convert some of the insights that we get from the design thinking and facilitation sessions and, and be able to quantify those in terms of development. So there still needs to be a level of accountability, not least of all because we are a, a municipal venture, so there needs to be a level of um, accountability and, and transparency there. Uh, but it absolutely doesn't impact the, the productivity from a development perspective. So we do have that 70-20-10 uh, mandate, which does allow us to have some flexibility. Not all of our time is quantified, not all of the time is, uh, is, is that rigid. But we do need to, when we're handing products back to, in this case, City Hall, be able to quantify how, how we got to that point. All right, thank you. So uh, we're going out of time already. So probably if there will be any questions, uh, we'll contact you by the provided details. Have a lovely day then. And thank you once again. Right. Bye. So that was the last presentation for today. And now uh, for the wrap up, a short, uh, a short video, a short video presentation. All right. <laughs> okay, a recorded uh, video presentation. Hi there. I'm Kirsten Bright. I'm the CEO of a company called Houston Based in Canada. Uh, I'm sorry that I couldn't be there in person to uh, participate. Hi there. I'm Curtis McBride. I'm the CEO of a company called MyVision Technologies based in Canada. Uh, I'm sorry that I couldn't be there in person to uh, participate in the conference, but I really appreciate the opportunity to present to you remotely. Um, today we're going to be talking about the smart city and I guess in particular our view of the smart city which is one of, of an open architecture, a future based on, on open architecture to create the smart city. Uh, so when we, when we first um, think about the smart city, uh, we always find that it's important to, to put the smart city in the context of the sort of the arc of human history, right? So when we first started out, you know, we uh, you know, we were we were very we were tribal. You know, we, we lived kind of without uh, in, in nomadic lifestyles. And you know, over history, we've we've uh, gone through different evolutions of what it meant to live in a city. You know, at some point, a group of people figured out that piling rocks really high and building castles was safer than than not. Um, you know, we moved into uh, farming communities, uh, pre-industrial, then industrial, uh, and into the modern cities that we live in today. And, and we think that we're on the verge of yet another big change in how we live in, in our cities, uh, one based on, on digitization of the city uh, and one that we've, we've started to call the smart city, quite commonly. Um, there's a few different things that are driving this change. So, uh, you know, we, we see three different pillars of, of, uh, of, of, of social um, uh, macro trends that are, that are driving us towards the smart city. So the first one is urbanization. More people live in cities than, than have ever lived in cities before in human history. And that trend has continued. More and more people are moving into, into cities. Um, you know, more than 50% of the population of, of the world now lives in, in large cities. Uh, the other one is, is the, the prevalence of technology. Technology is, is moving faster than ever before. Things like Moore's Law, uh, which, which say that the speed of computers doubles every two years. Uh, and a number of other trends, um, you know, in the fields of AI, connected vehicles, autonomous vehicles, uh, blockchain, all of these new types of technologies are coming on the scene and starting to, uh, to put pressures on, on the cities and what, what is traditionally meant to live in those cities. And the third one is citizen expectation. You know, in our, in our private lives, um, you know, we can go online and we can shop 24 hours a day. We can have things delivered to our house, you know, really easily. Uh, all of the services that we expect in our, as consumers um, you know, are, are right at our fingertips through the internet. But our cities uh, and our relationship with cities is, is still kind of stuck in that 20th century paradigm. And, and the demands, uh, the expectations of citizens, the demands that they put on the cities are, are growing. Um, and the cities ultimately will need to adapt. So our view is that a uh, smart city is one that uses technology and data to improve the livability of cities. So, so basically, cities become 
uh, places people want to be through the application of technology and, and the impacts that, 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 that technology can create. Uh, but in large part, and you're seeing some, you know, some pockets of smart city, you know, different examples around the world uh, where where smart cities are being employed. But in large part, uh, you know, the majority of the, the services and experiences that we have within cities are still are still stuck in that 20th century paradigm, and and that status quo is driven by uh, a number of things. One of them that we we speak a lot about is this notion of, of vendor lock-in, right? So most of the the architecture, most of the, the the, the infrastructure that we installed in the 20th century was built on closed systems. So, so data was sort of trapped, you know, whether it's in a, the side of the road in an intersection control box um, or a pumping station, um, you know, that data is sort of trapped in proprietary formats that can't be, can't be set free, can't be, be used to solve, uh, solve problems. And, and that closed architecture slows down the rate of innovation. So, so cities, um, you know, even progressive cities that want to move faster, they want to be progressive, they want to bring uh, their citizens uh, into the 21st century, they're, they're prevented from doing so because of this legacy uh, closed architecture. Um, but the promise, if we can move off that, if we can move towards a more open architecture, one that, that facilitates a faster pace of innovation, is one where um, we can drive, you know, much more engagement from citizens uh, you know, citizens will, will want to live in cities that are more responsive um, and, and ultimately drive efficiency. I always say that anything that you measure improves and, and unfortunately because of this closed architecture, you know, we've never really been able to measure uh, to, the, to the fidelity, to the, to the sort of resolution that we need to, to make our cities more efficient. And, and all of that is sort of the promise of this, this open approach. Um, you know, some examples of, of the types of things that will be possible with this, this open architecture, this, this smart city, you know, things like optimization of traffic flow. Uh, that's sort of our, our specialty is, is helping cities to, to move vehicles through, through road networks. Um, things like, you know, reducing the number of, of rear end collisions. If you, if you have better progression through the network, you have safer roads. Things like giving green lights to emergency vehicles. Um, fires in homes double in size every 14 seconds. So if you can shave a minute off response time coming to, to uh, put a fire out, you can save lives, save property. You know, transit, uh, giving buses green lights to help them stay on schedule. You know, all these are examples of things that are very difficult to implement now, cost a lot, take a lot of time. Um, and the more you move to open architecture, the easier you make it to, to facilitate these kinds of uh, positive changes. Um, one of the analogies that we often use as, as a way to try to explain kind of where we see the, the evolution of the smart city, um, you know, I don't know how many people are, uh, are um, you know, of the age where you remember the days before the internet, but, you know, before the internet, you know, one of the, one of the things that you could do to, to access online information was you could log into tools like America Online. And this was the idea that, you know, you would, you would uh, dial into a system uh, and it had curated information. You could, you could go in there and you could, you know, chat with a number of people, you could send messages, but it was a very closed system, right? So only members of AOL or America Online could, could communicate with other members of America Online. Only members of where online could get the information that was available in there. Um, ultimately, you know, what was initially called the World Wide Web, and we now just call the internet, um, it came along and it blew it wide open, right? All of a sudden you could communicate with anyone, uh, didn't matter how you were accessing the internet, it was one giant network, all the information, uh, the sort of the entire history of human knowledge ultimately migrated onto the internet. And we look back at the, the AOL time in the evolution of the internet, and it's kind of a footnote history, you know, it's the, the butt of jokes, um, and, and really the, the World Wide Web, the internet, uh, has become the norm. And, and we think that the smart city is kind of in that same moment in time. It's having its AOL moment where, um, you know, big companies are coming in and talking about this, this closed monolithic approach to the smart city. Uh, and ultimately, we believe very strongly that, that the, the internet is more is more uh, a better analogy for how the smart city will ultimately evolve as a, as a loose network of open uh, open systems. Um, and 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 I guess to further to that point, uh, the way we think about the future of the smart city is, is is this notion of a platform. So you know, so many uh, analogies in in you know 
enterprise software and, and other aspects of our lives, you know, online um, commerce, uh, we can think of a lot of those things as, 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 a, as an old paradigm moving on to a software platform. And the city is going to be no different. And, and when we think about this notion of, of um, city as a platform, we think of it in these, in these five layers. So the first layer is the physical city, right? It was built up over the last 50, 100 years. Uh, it has all of the, you know, the devices, uh, intersection control and buses and emergency vehicles, street lights, all of these devices that have been installed in the cities over, over the years. Um, increasingly, what we're seeing happening now is that those devices are being connected. So we're, we're going out, whether we're putting in fiber optic networks or radio networks or cellular networks, and we're, we're digitizing these, these legacy infrastructure elements in the city. And, and ultimately, on top of that communication, we're building applications. Uh, and the applications is where the return on investment happens. So we want to optimize traffic flow. We want to better understand um, the underground water distribution systems. We want to keep buses uh, running on schedule to encourage people to take public transit. And, and, and this architecture, sort of the physical city, connecting the data, getting the ROI, that's typically how cities think about um, city infrastructure and, and, and typically how they think about moving to a, a smarter, more, more information rich uh, environment. But we argue that that's an incomplete model. And, and the reason why is because uh, the ROI that you realize from the data that you are able to generate, uh, that's the end of the ROI that you made possible because you didn't choose to make the data open. So that data, because it's closed, can only ever be used to drive that ROI that justified the initial uh, deployment of, of, of networks and, and data acquisition. So if cities go one step further and they make a decision to uh, procure um, city infrastructure with, with what we call open architecture as a philosophy. And open architecture basically means that you have the option as a city to open the data up in the future and use it for different applications. Then if you, if you trust the innovation economy, right, you, tr you trust that smart people um, will, will come in on top of all of that data and find interesting correlations between data that you generate at an intersection and data that you generate in an emergency services sense and data that you generate in a parking sense, that, that all of a sudden new ROIs, new returns on investment that you may not have thought about before, but may not have been possible to justify if you had to run this entire stack just for that application, those ROIs become possible and we get this major acceleration in, in the uh, the types of services that can be delivered on top of data, not unlike what we saw with the internet, where once all that information is out there and it's open, um, new services that you know 20 years ago we would never even have imagined um, all of a sudden become possible. So we, we talk a lot about this 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 model. It's gaining traction uh, with cities around the world. Um, it's a big change because it means that you have to you have to think about your procurements differently. You have to think about open open architecture and really um, get a Get a good handle on, on what that what that all means, but we believe that this is the, the true uh, the true smart city and the true power of, of the smart city will be realized uh, once you know a material amount of the data generated in the city uh, adopts this open open approach. Um, so, sort of in, in in summary, our our view of the city as a platform um, is not one of a closed you know, America Online uh, kind of architecture where a single vendor controls all of the, the data elements of the city, builds all this middleware to, to connect it all. Our vision of the smart city is one of a, an open platform uh, where, where, you know, the innovation economy and the hundreds of, of developer teams that might want to build on top of it um, can, can, can approach it in an open standards-based way and, uh, and truly it will change the way that we experience living in cities. Um, you know, and, and, and if we sort of look to the future of, of you know, connected infrastructure, connected vehicles, um, you know, all of this becomes, uh, becomes, becomes possible, but again, you have to really start with this notion of, of open architecture. So again, thank you very much for the time uh, you, you've, you've given me, spent, spent letting me uh, speak about this. Uh, I would have loved to be a, there in person for the conference. Um, and I hope at some point uh, in the future get to uh, get to uh, to meet some of you 
and that uh, Myogen has an opportunity to show you what we can we can do using this this open philosophy. Thanks very much. No, not okay. So we finished for today. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your time, and uh, we still have some coffee if you wish, some coffee and some buns. Right. Have a lovely evening then.